May 24, 1941, Hitler's newest superweapon, battleship Bismarck, has obliterated the symbol of British sea power, HMS Hood, and crippled the battleship Prince of Wales. The tragic news spreads rapidly. The reaction in Britain to the loss of the hood was a, a mixture of, of fury and a desire for revenge, an absolute shock. This was the pride of the Royal Navy. This was the unsinkable ship. This was the mighty hood. The effect on the morale in Great Britain was absolutely catastrophic. The British respond quickly and decisively. Prime Minister Winston Churchill vows Bismarck must be sunk at all costs. We all wanted to revenge the hood. There's no doubt about it. Every ship in the Navy, the smallest ship, the biggest ship in the Navy, wanted to revenge the hood. And that's what we sent out to do. Within hours after Hood's sinking, nearly every warship in the North Atlantic is sent to reinforce Fleet Admiral John Tubby's command. Bismarck has been spotted here, 700 miles from the coast of France. Admiral Tubby's battle group is here, 130 miles directly north. Tubby must slow Bismarck down to get in range to strike. In perfect position for this mission is a task group steaming in from the south, known as Force H, which includes the aircraft carrier Ark Royal. May 26, 1941, 7 p.m., eight hours after finding Bismarck, 15 swordfish torpedo bombers from Ark Royal speed toward the German battleship. Lieutenant John Jock Moffat pilots one of the ferry swordfish. We were told to go in there and do our best and get as many torpedoes into her as we could possibly do. Moffat and his crew break through the clouds and descend on their target. Moffat closes to within 2,000 yards and prepares to launch. There was a voice suddenly says to me, not yet, Jock. And this was my observer. And I thought, what? what's happening? And, and he kept saying it, not yet, not yet. And then out of the corner of my eye, I, I happened to turn slightly to the, to the right. And there was a friend of mine hanging outside this aircraft with his bottom in the air, but I don't know how he did it, in fact. But he was leaning right outside the aircraft with his head right underneath the fuselage. And he was shouting, not yet, not yet. And then it dawned on me, why? In these high seas, Moffat's observer knows that if the torpedo hits the top of a wave, the impact could veer it off course. With only one torpedo, he has to make the shot count. He hangs upside down, judging the wave height, waiting for the right moment. If you could release the torpedo that went into a trough of the wave, then you had a chance. And that's when he said to me, let her go. And when I said, let her go, he said, Jock, we've got a runner. Bismarck makes a hard turn to port to avoid the torpedo. It's a fatal miscalculation. 51 seconds after Moffat launches, the deadly missile strikes Bismarck's port side on her stern. The violent explosion tears a huge hole in the hull. Bismarck's unarmored twin runners, angled for the hard turn to avoid the torpedo, jam 12 degrees to port. The swordfish have crippled the mighty battleship. With rudders jammed, Bismarck can only steam back toward her enemy. The British surface fleet closes in for the killing blow. Finally, there's an opportunity to avenge the hood, and the British go into action confident that they can achieve this. 
On King George V, Fleet Admiral John Tuffy plots his tactics. His plan? Force the cornered German ship to divide its fire against multiple targets. Then, turn his ship's broadside, unleashing massive firepower. Battleships Rodney and King George V speed to within 12 miles of Bismarck. 